Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 242, featuring an interview with none other than MCA himself, Mr. Chris Avalon. Uh, this time, Chris is on the show to talk about, of course, the tournament uh, Tides of Numenera game. Uh, was very successfully kickstarted, went way over its uh, funding goal. And there's some really exciting stuff going on with this game, so I wanted to have Chris on to tell us all about the ongoing uh, development process. A lot of uh, really great stuff. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Chris Avalon. All right, folks, I'm here with the great Chris Avalon, the uh, senior narrative designer of Torment. Uh, Tides of Numenera. How are you today, Chris? I am doing great. And Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing excellent. Now, why don't we start off just by talking about your role on the project. I, I was a little shocked when they, I first started to hear about the Kickstarter uh, that you weren't, I guess you weren't affili affiliated with it right away. You were, in fact, a stretch goal. So I mean, how's it working out now? Uh, it's working out great. Initially, uh, Brian Fargo actually invited me to be part of the project from the get-go, but um, considering how much work was going on with Wasteland 2 and then Project at Obsidian, it seemed like that might just be too much work to handle. Uh, but then the producer for Torment Tides of Numenera, Kevin Saunders, uh, who I worked with on Mask of the Betrayer and Neverwinter Nights 2, he was like, well, would you be available to do uh, a review of design documents and see if they kind of meet the Planescape theme? And if you had time to do a companion, maybe we could work you out as a stretch goal that way. And that seemed like a reasonable amount of work. Um, so uh, we brought it up with uh, Fergus here at Obsidian, and he was all for it. And then we just went from there. So how is Numenera going to be different than uh, the first Planescape Torment? Well, um, first off, it's using uh, Monty Cook's uh, Numenera setting, which is kind of a mix of, you know, I, it's almost, it's it's hard to classify with just a single sentence. But if I were to throw some concepts out there, if, if you're familiar with uh, like Jane Wolfe's like uh, Earth of the New Sun or uh, Jack Vance's Dying Earth, or there's a lot of Earth going on there. But um, the whole idea is that world is a sort of like a huge graveyard of all these different technologies that have sort of had their eras, you know, come and gone. But they're all lying around in wreckage in this world. So there's all these like, crazy landscapes that were built with technology and, you know, nanites in the landscape that look like, you know, spirits and things like that. And the players actually find like these discarded bits of technology and use those as magic items. And um, uh, another good example is if you ever read uh, uh, a book called Roadside Picnic, there's certain areas of Numenera that have very much a sort of crazy technology environmental feel to them that I think is, uh, is very much part of the setting. But I think that ends up being a really good complement to the environments that we tried to do in Planescape in the first place. Like there's, no environment that I think I've read in any of the Numenera design documents that feels like a safe, a safe location filled with expectations, if that makes any sense. Like that they're not, none of them are a typical fantasy location. Um, I was going through uh, George uh, Zeit's design for this area called the Bloom, and basically he's designed this huge creature who has all these maws and portals to other dimensions and parts of the world and you arrive inside this being and you have to figure out some way to unlock it from the inside and it is the most interesting and yet horrifying thing that i've read just from the sound effect descriptions alone because it just sounds so gross to traverse it it's like you're walking around in someone's stomach and um I think that when they have uh, ideas for areas like that in Numenera, that feels very planscape to me because I feel like they're trying to take the sort of classic uh, RPG dungeon crawling experience and sort of give it uh, a different uh, backdrop and a different set of um, uh, parameters for the player to experience and sort of shake things up. But um, aside from that, like I think the, uh, the there's a lot of um, depth of the companion interaction. Uh, there is a lot of different options that occur depending on what companion combinations you have in your party. Uh, there is a very strong theme running through it and they even took it one step further 
by having the actual sort of um, I, it's not really a morality system per se, but the but the, the sort of emotional tides that take place in the game, those are very strongly interwoven in the plot, and I think more so than the alignment system was in the original uh, Torment. So. Um, I think that they're doing a lot of the same sort of um, uh, types of things that Torment did, but I think that they're improving on it and evolving it in a lot of new directions too, which uh, I think is going to work out really well. So it's safe to say this uh, change to a setting is not going to change the nature of the of a game. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had to, had to throw that in. I was, you know, you mentioned this Tides system, and that, that's really piqued my curiosity. I just wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that system. Well, it's a, a system that uh, Kevin and uh, Colin, who's the uh, lead creative designer, and Adam Heine, who was actually a programmer in the original Torment, uh, they sat down and sort of invented this emotional physics system that takes place in this section of Numenera. And the player, I, I don't want to give away too much about the connections to the plot, but the player can cause a lot of ripple effects and changes in those tides over the course of the game and also be affected by them. And uh, I think that that's going to make an interesting twist on, I guess, more on, on other morality systems I've seen implemented in games in the past. This one feels um, a lot different and both external and also more internal than I'm used to. It's really hard to explain, but I, I once you're about, uh, I think, part of the way through Act 1, you'll really start seeing how those things play out in the world. And it's pretty exciting. And then also the crisis system, which I'm still trying to wrap my head up. <laughs> you know, I've read the design, a uh, little design document. What, what was it called? The uh, Yeah, it's called the crisis system. Uh, the crisis system. And I'm trying to wrap my head around how you know what this system is like and you know, what it's going to be like to play with this system. And I'm also a little curious about it, you know, from your uh, perspective, what it's like to write for this system. Uh, a lot of the writing I've done for it is usually uh, from the companion uh, effects on it or the companion uh, being victimized <laughs> by those crises. Uh, the one thing that I like about uh, Numenera is there were, point, there were points in the original Torment where we had to include like various trash mobs and sort of encounter fights in some of the dungeons and even that was pretty few but what, what, but what, what Numenera is trying to do is they're trying to make about just about every combat encounter have narrative significance and a lot of repercussions occur as a result of that combat. So rather than actually having sort of like trash mobs to fight, they've actually focused each of those combats into making it narratively relevant and then making sure there's a lot of um, dramatic connections and then narrative connections with both, uh, with both the companions and the player and how each of them react in that crisis situation. So they're, I feel like they're really heavy, heavily narratively script in a lot of respects, which is actually pretty cool. Yeah, so we're is it Adam Hine? Is that his? Yeah, Heine. Heine. Yeah. Yeah, so we're I, Adam Heine was calling the game a storytelling simulator, quote unquote, instead of a combat simulator. So, you know, I'm kind of curious. I know uh, you're not a fan of the trash mobs, but you know, I can't help but think combat does, is very important to a, a role playing game. So, just wondering, what, what is your take on this? Well, I think it, uh, it it ties in a lot with the uh, the crisis system. I th what. Uh, what Adam and Kevin and Colin are trying to do is they still want to include uh, combat in the title and make it stronger than it was in Torment, but I think they're also being respectful with what the first game was trying to do and make it actually story relevant to, for, for, every, for each of those combat encounters you have, it, they're not just a fight. They actually contribute something to the plot. Um, they have uh, a lot of dramatic repercussions in the area you're at. Uh, it could have a lot of consequences for you and your relationship with your companions down the road, uh, depending how much they either suffer or intervene or how much they watch other companions suffer and intervene in the crisis. And I think that sort of evolves combat to a new level that I think is appropriate for a torment story story um, style game. Yeah, I heard you use the term emotional physics a while ago. And that's a really interesting way to put it. 
I was I had not considered that <laughs> aspect for and when they and when they presented the tide system as being like that, uh, I I saw how it was playing out in the game, and I think from a game mechanic perspective, that's pretty interesting. And, and from a story standpoint, then I also get really excited about it too, because then I want to see how all those how all those different emotional options play out both in the past and in the world and the present and then for like the end the end slides how they factor into the end game sequences and they've got a lot of that stuff specked out in a really interesting way so yeah no i've i've been pretty impressed with what, they, what they've come up with i almost feel useless most of the time <laughs> uh, so what do you think about this decision that the game go turn based and as you know even before that why did you even why was this even put up for a vote do you think that would be something that the uh, that you guys would have just Sort of, uh, well, handed down you know, by um, that's a good question. I think with the turn-based options, I actually don't care whether a game is a real-time or real-time with pause or turn-based, as long as that combat mechanic system is complementing the game itself. And I think turn-based uh, works a lot better for Torment. Uh, and I, and I, 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 it's strange for me to say that considering the first game was real time with pause, but I think it's important to remember that with the first Torment game, we actually didn't really have an option. Like we had to use the Infinity Engine. We were pretty tight on resources and we actually made a lot of decisions to make the implementation easier as opposed to, hey, what would we have liked to do in a perfect world? And like I, that, that heralds back to when we were going to do um, the Van Buren Fallout game, a Fallout 3 version that Black Isle was trying to do before it got canceled, we very much wanted to make that turn-based because that felt, you know, that that was Fallout to us. And I think with uh, turn-based options, you get a lot of really cool um, uh, tactical elements. Uh, I think that it allows you to pace out the combats both as a developer and a player uh, and also... With a crisis system, I think it also allows for a lot of cool interruptions for either drama or dialogue sequences or reactivity that'll be a little bit harder and I think a little bit clumsier to do with a real time um, with a real time system. And again, uh, I know that uh, obviously, like when you're developing a game, usually all those decisions are made internally at the studio, and then you try and sell those decisions to the people. Uh, you're making the game for. I think with Kickstarter, it's a little bit different in that um, you actually know who your audience is. You know who loves this type of game. And I think that's why uh, they presented it up for, hey, what do you guys think about this? And that's one of the things I love about Kickstarter is they actually, uh, you can actually ask for opinions, uh, weigh, weigh the feedback you're given. Um, and you don't necessarily do everything the backers describe but if you don't implement something you're able usually to explain to your audience with a critique as to why you don't implement it in a certain way but in this case i think turn by turn based combat system works really well especially with a lot of the narrative systems that i've seen mm -hmm. that's interesting so are there are other things that people have suggested that have, have been implemented um that i'm not sure about i know that what kevin saunders did was he actually and so kevin's like Kevin's one of the best producers I've worked with because he is able to both simultaneously quantify everything and then also at the same time know that a role as a producer is not to dictate creative content, but to help Adam and Colin implement their vision. Uh, and then he applies that to the backer responses too. So when people actually have suggestions for the game for torment uh that goes up in the forum and then kevin's always very good about letting people know uh when it's being reviewed considered what the status status of it is and if it's not implemented or, or if it is implemented he will cite all the reasons why they go down in that certain direction and i will say he also applies that to suggestions that i give whether he agrees with them or not whenever i walk away from a conversation with kevin and there might be a certain suggestion or a feature like, hey, you know, we you know what about adding this here? Kevin always has a really good answer for if he can't do it, why he can't do it. And then it usually always makes sense to me. So and that's just kind of his approach to it. So you'd mentioned that with the first Planescape Torment, in some ways you were constrained by the, you know, the folks that owned all the, the IP. And I'm wondering, you know, with this with this go around with Monty Cook's world, uh, do you feel like you have more flexibility? 
Uh, yeah, just as much actually. And you know, to be honest, we actually didn't have that much uh, publisher. I'm trying to think of the polite way to say this. I mean, okay, well, there was really no publisher interference as far as Planescape was concerned. I think the only time there was a serious review period was Monty and some other folks from, uh, I believe it was TSR at the time. They came out, they listened to our pitch for the game for one day, and then they walked away with, I think, one comment. And otherwise, they were like, this is all fine. Like, you can modify the rule sets for D&D however you want. Uh, these spells are fine. Don't worry about this. We like the arc for the character. Uh, you're doing some odd things here. But overall, that's what Planescape's all about. Like, it's a very – it's a world that um, – encourages you, I guess, to sort of step outside the limitations of the rule set. And I think that was one of his guiding principles in going into Numenera. He's like, you know, even even the even the rule system that's present in that world is actually a lot more relaxed than I'm used to. And it feels like it does a lot more to encourage fun character builds and allow you to do more cool things in combat. Like when Colin was GMing our Numenera games, for example, I found there was very little that I couldn't try and do and a good amount of stuff that I actually could succeed at with help from the other party members or by choosing to expend a certain amount of effort with certain roles to make it happen. And it made for a pretty dynamic experience. So um, it's, it's, at, it's at least as freeing as Planescape was. I'm a little curious what that one comment was. From uh, the... TSR. Oh, oh, uh, so, okay. So not only this is going to be interesting. So the comment was Monty wanted to make sure that, um, there was a diversity in the looks of all the people that were in Sigil. And this is something that Monty goes back to, and, he, and he's to be commended for it. Uh, he always wants to make sure that there's always a range of different uh, cultural styles, uh, looks to characters. So not everything ends up being white Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> uh, and I think that that's great. And I think one interesting thing about Numenera is actually that's one of the foundations for the setting. Like it's actually unusual to see a uh, a white skinned human in Numenera. Like actually, that's more rare than any other uh, skin tone in the world. And that was one of the comments that he made. And I think uh, they're working hard to do that with uh, with Numenera and just making sure that they're they're keeping that in mind as they're designing the characters. We're certainly keeping it in mind as we design the companions. So my next question has to do with the, I guess a little bit to do with the world, and this really unique uh, setting. I was reading about the crafting, you know, system in the game and how, yes. big, of, how big of a role is. It's, it sounds like this is going to be a much bigger deal uh, than it's been before in other games, you know, the, the way the, the crafting ties into the story and the character interactions and all that. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about this uh, crafting system. Well, uh, the, it was designed by Adam Heine, uh, and it utilizes a lot of the concepts that are in Numenera, where basically there's all this uh, old technological junk that's lying around. It's really hard to determine what it was once used for. So people will take old bits of technology and then use them in different ways. Um, and the crafting system in the game also reflects that. What I like about the crafting system, strangely enough, is even if you fail at it, or it appears that there isn't an effect at first, it's always an advantage to sort of play around with the items in your inventory to either free up space. So when you combine two items, um, you actually end up like being able to gather more stuff to your character. Um, and also the way he set up the effect system for each of the items, it can cause some really interesting combat effects. Like uh, I think one of the ones Adam was talking about was you could attach these uh, these pieces of technology called ciphers. I, I believe that they're called. You could attach them, like to say, to your weapons, for example. So, like, whenever you hit someone with uh, with you know with 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 a weapon, it might end up teleporting the enemy away a certain distance. Or if you attach it to your armor, for example, uh, en enemies that strike you will suddenly start getting teleported away, which creates some interesting combat situations. Um, and also sometimes those bits of technology have interesting little quirks about them. Like uh, I think he had one where, um, uh, let's see, I think he had, he had one where it's like uh, if you, it's like a summoning device for imps, for example. Like you can, you can attach this to a weapon to summon imps to attack like your, your enemy or whatever. But 
it may actually have a hidden quirk in the actual technology. So, you know, one out of every 10 times, it might summon a third variety of creature that ends up attacking everybody. So that ends up kind of throwing some interesting uh, interesting surprises in the mix when you're actually uh, fighting in combat. And I think it's going to add a lot to the game. <clears throat> uh, me too. So just a couple of last questions here. I know you're pressed for time. <laughs> So I have to ask, you know, last time we talked a lot about your character Ravel and how she's ah. mysteriously appears in all these different games. So I don't know how much of this you want to give away, but, you know, will, will, will she have a role to play? Will she be in the new game somehow? Uh, you know what? I hate to uh, say no, but I, I'm going to say no. She will She will not be making an appearance in, uh, in Numenera. And actually, the the only reason for that is... Even though we have rights to the name Torment, we don't have rights to the characters that appeared in the first game. So you won't encounter the Nameless One, you won't encounter Fall from Grace, um, that cast of characters, unfortunately, you won't encounter. But we're hoping the new cast of characters you you encounter in this game will be just as memorable. And I think they will, based on everything I've seen and written. Um, but yes, no, she won't show up. So her her last appearance or her last uh, archetype style was in uh, Knights of the Republic Two, and I think that was that's probably the last I'm going to say about Ravel, unless somehow Obsidian goes back to the Forgotten Realms or goes back to Planescape somehow. Okay, so are there going to be rats? <laughs> <laughs> Man, doing the rats for oh, tomorrow was awesome. Gotta be. Um, yeah, there's got to be rats. It's... So here's the weird thing. So while I was reading the reading uh, the Bloom area design, the even though there's no rats in the game, you actually feel like a rat in that area. Like you actually feel like you're the rats in the walls trying to find a way to escape and get and get and sort of find your way to the heart of this creature and. Uh, and the the sense of being a small trapped creature in a much larger world, I think uh, that feeling of ratdom definitely uh, comes out in the bloom. So uh, I guess the N Numenera is already reversing uh, that theme by making you feel like a rat as opposed to including rats in the game. So we'll see how it plays out in practice, but I think uh, players are really going to like it. Yeah, I always feel like a rat, so I should be quite at home. <laughs> so last question is, uh, I'm just wondering whose face is going to be on the box? I don't know. You know what? That should have been a backer reward. <laughs> <laughs> I understand last time it was just kind of a random thing that wasn't guido that ended up on the box no it was guido it was our, yeah. it was our producer uh guido hinkle so he's not being called back to the studio for that <laughs> you know i don't i don't actually know what character he could dress up as to be honest because the uh we obviously don't have the just the oh god we have such a cast of characters uh i don't know you know what i think it would have made a great backer reward but uh i think perhaps some of the symbology that's present in the game might be more appropriate for a cover image, but I think I'm going to let the uh, the marketing guys come to the final decision for that. But who knows? All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention or things that no, I should have uh, asked about that didn't get? Uh, no, actually, Matt, I just appreciate uh, you you inviting me on the program, and I, I certainly hope uh, you enjoy enjoy the the signed Planescape box. It's absolutely my pleasure to to send it to you. And uh, no, I just appreciate the questions, and I really love Matt Chat, and I really appreciate that you do that. Well, thank you very much. I'll let you get back to work now, so we can get that game a little bit sooner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt. Thank you very much. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a new retrospective. Probably going to be doing a game called Vampire uh, the Masquerade Bloodline. So stay tuned for that. Also, let me know if you've played the game and have some thoughts of your own. Uh, little things you think I should, should know about because I'm kind of going in blind to it. So uh, let me know. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much, guys, if you have supported me in my efforts to preserve our video game legacy uh, with interviews with great people like Chris. If you want to support the show, you can do that in a couple different ways. Uh, the easiest, and in my opinion, one of the best ways is just to go to the link in the show notes to the Patreon site. All I ask is a, a dollar a month uh, for, to keep these episodes coming, so uh, go over there and, and sign up for a subscription. It only takes a couple of minutes 
uh, totally safe. So, uh, I, and plus that'll give you some access to some special podcasts, Google Air Hangouts, and some other fun stuff. So, uh, thank you very much if you would like to do that. Uh, also, really appreciate you guys if you help spread the word about the show. Uh, that doesn't cost anything uh, to post a, a Twitter, a Twitter tweet, a Facebook. A status update, whatever you like uh, to use. Now spread the word, keep the views up. Uh, more views I get, the easier it is to recruit our really talented, big name uh, people like Chris onto the show. So thank you very much. However you support the show, guys, I really, really appreciate it. Oh, let's see, news from the Matt Cave. Uh, a couple of cool new uh, collectibles sent in to me by Al, uh, Al Vallely. Uh, the Smite and Magic 6 box. You can see the box is a little bit dinged up, but all the great stuff still inside. I even had that awesome cloth matte bandana thing. Uh, just really cool stuff. You know, they just don't have packages like this anymore. Um, then also, I have the Pools of Darkness uh, game that he sent in. And this is uh, really exciting because this is the only uh, Forgotten Realms uh, fantasy game, <laughs> Forgotten Realms Gold Box game that I've never played. Played all the other ones on the C64, but they never released this one on the Commodore. So I'm thinking about going all the way back to Pools of Radiance and bringing the whole party all the way through, all the way through to Pools uh, of Darkness. So that'd be a pretty fun project. You know, maybe I can get a couple of you guys to join me on that epic adventure. All right, some sad, uh, sad news. Donald Levine, the father of the G.I. Joe and the concept of the action figure in general has passed away. Uh, Donald Levine. Uh, you know, I don't know if you played with uh, G.I. Joes, but I strongly suspect you probably did. I wonder, you know, do they have G.I. Joes in other countries, I wonder? Because they always said it was a true American hero. I wonder if they changed that to, like, true German hero or true, <laughs> true Polish hero. Uh, who knows? Uh, also, Diesel Stormers, that Kickstarter project I talked about last time, that has been funded. Uh, just barely squeezed by. I think they got maybe 52000 out of 50000 uh, I didn't mention this last time, but these are the guys uh, from Spellbound Entertainment. Uh, they did the Desperados series and the Arcania, some of those Arcania games, some of the Gothic stuff. And then uh, lastly, the X Rebirth game. Uh, you know, I covered the X3, I think it was Terran Conflict, or maybe it's Albion Prelude. Uh, both of those are great games, but the new, newest one that came out was a bit of a flop. It had some pretty serious flaws. Now, apparently, they've just released this huge update. They're calling it 2.0. And uh, from what I'm reading, they've addressed some of those concerns uh, with the cockpits and other, other stuff. So if you haven't played the game, you might want to check it out now that they got this new patch out. I'd love to know what your thoughts are. If it's something, maybe it's, you know, <laughs> patched enough now to make it playable. All right, what about that ale of the week? Uh, back by popular demand. Uh, this week I've got the uh, Midnight Rider American Black Ale. This is from the Indeed Brewing Company, and this is uh, right out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, so just up the road. I was thinking it would be a really fun sort of a mini special maybe to go visit the brew pub. You know, assuming that they have a brew pub, it would be fun to show up there and record a little live segment. A uh, really interesting design on this can. we got this guy riding a bear. Not sure what they were smoking when they came up with that one. Oh, uh, let's see. Midnight Rider. Six varieties of American hops. A 90-minute boil. Well, that sounds painful. Really hate to get those 90-minute boils. Uh, resinous, piney character to this black ale. 6.5% uh, alcohol by volume, so uh, definitely respectable. Adventure awaits you. Anyway, let's get this thing uh, into the drinking horn and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Midnight Rider here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> Smelling this smells a little bit like paint thinner. <sighs> I need to sit down. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It smells quite nice. Uh, you can definitely smell those caramels, that sort of darker aroma, sort of the nutty thing that you get with these black ales. Uh, quite nice. Uh, not a real pungent aroma here, uh, but that doesn't smell bad. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Oh, oh really nice. Uh, definitely bitter. I'm getting some kind of grapefruit, like grape taste to that. Bit of a, definitely taste of chocolate, sort of coffee flavors you get with these. Um, nice and thick and creamy. I love that. Uh, let me try it again. Oh, I'm getting a little bit of that peanut butter taste too in the, in the back taste there. Ah. Uh. Yeah, it's really, uh, really a lively, uh, crisp uh, experience here. A lot of flavor packed into this. Um, relatively, what is that flavor there? Maybe, what is that, a bit of a, 
Uh, I can't quite put my finger on that. Now, let me let me try it again. It was kind of a. I guess you'd call that maybe a tart uh, flavor. It's sort of like uh, like prune juice, a little bit of a prune-like flavor to it. Anyway, it's really really good stuff. Uh, it's probably not something you'd want to quaff uh, rapidly with that 6.5% alcohol, uh, but definitely tasty. Uh, let's see what to give this. I guess we'll give this one a four out of five. Uh, drinking horn sounds about right. Anyway, really nice uh, selection there. I noticed, and, and I've also noticed that the store has a couple different uh, varieties from this company. Indeed, uh, so I'll be trying some of those out hopefully in the upcoming episodes. Anyway, let's wrap this thing up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotations about torment, and I found one from Napoleon Bonaparte. It's always good for a quotation. And it's a bit long, so I'll just have to read this. The torment of precautions often exceeds the dangers to be avoided. It is sometimes better to abandon, one, to abandon oneself to destiny. See you guys next week. Good evening. Tonight on Is There, we examine the question, is there a life after death? <laughs> and here to discuss it are three dead people. <laughs> the late Sir Brian Hardacre, former curator of the...